We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Jeff Christian, Managing Partner of CPM Group. Thanks for joining me, Jeff. How are you? Tom, it's great to be with you. I'm, I'm good. Very busy, I th- as, as I think most people in the precious metals markets right now. Mm-hmm. Very busy, uh, very complicated markets and economic and political environment that we're dealing with. But hey, I think that makes me happy. Well, I mean, there's there's always something to do and always something to discuss. And, you know, looking at this picture that we're facing right now, um, I appreciate you kind of sitting down with me for a little bit here to really get into the details of how you and, and CPM Group are seeing this environment and, and what is coming into play right now. Um, but I thought we could kind of start with the Fed. It has suggested that in September, it will lower the overnight lending rate by 25 basis points. And much of the market expects it to do the same. So, of course, being data dependent, the Fed always cites CPI numbers. So has the Fed really changed its inflation target for 2% or is there more nuance to understand here? That's interesting because um, if you look at it, 2% is an idealized target. And if you listen to the Fed carefully, what they say is we'd like to see sort of an average of 2% over time. Uh, and they know that, you know, it's it's like you can't hit 2% and stay there. Uh, and if you look at CPI over the period of time, say the last 20 years or so, when this, since the, the Fed has said we have a target of 2% CPI, uh, it's fluctuated between maybe like you know, well, zero actually went negative a couple of times where we had you know lower prices in a given month, but it's fluctuated mostly between like say 1.3 and 3.4. It's a couple of spikes up to four or five percent on a given month, uh, and then you know excluding the the aberration of 2021. So the Fed looks for a long range idealized target of two percent. But it readily will accept, say, 1.8 to to 2.8 as 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 good numbers on a given month. And if you go back, there were periods of time, say, between 2010 and 2018, where inflation got below 1.8 and it got very low and it actually went into you know negative uh, territory once or twice uh, in a given month. The Fed was concerned that interest rate, inflation was too low, you know. But I don't think the Fed's actually changed its target. What it has perhaps done is tried to be more explicative <laughs> in what its target actually is and how it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when we think about that that target, Jeff, <clears throat> why is it acceptable? I mean, there, there's a couple of different ways to look at it, but why is it acceptable to the Fed to basically destroy, you know, two to three percent of people's purchasing power per month in a way? And like, does that give them the ability to kind of control the thermostat of the economy? And is that the reason for, you know, that that two to three, let's say one point eight, right. as you said, to two point eight or three percent target? Two percent on an annualized basis. And you shouldn't ask me because I've never understood it. I don't understand <laughs> why you I don't understand why you accept two percent inflation. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of accepting some inflation rests in the economic theory that if you have a dynamic economy that's growing, there will be upward increases in prices. Uh, but why it's two percent and why it's acceptable, I've never understood. Uh, and I've never really argued that it is, you know, good. And I've never really argued about it much in general. But yeah, don't ask me because I don't understand why you would accept it, the, uh, a persistent deterioration in purchasing power. Other than the fact that if you look at the broad history of like the last two thousand years of GDP and inflation, and there are. Data, well, there's data going back to like 1700 
uh, for inflation in England. Uh, the United States didn't exist, so we didn't <laughs> have that data. Uh, if you look at it, there has always been some inflation correlated with positive economic growth. So I guess the you know the, the accepted wisdom is that you have to accept some inflation in order to have economic growth. And if you don't, if you try to go to zero percent inflation, what you're going to find is zero percent GDP. Interesting. So, Jeff, do you think there's a possibility that the Fed surprises one way or another by by cutting more or not at all? There is a possibility. I don't think it's a probability. I think, you know, the, the yeah. when I started in the business in the 70s and early 80s, the Fed and other central banks were incredibly secretive. And it was really with Paul Volcker and then especially Alan Greenspan, where the chairman said, let's be more transparent. And Alan, especially in the 1980s, started saying much more than the Fed normally spoke about. You know. uh, but I think that over the ensuing 40 years, you've seen increased transparency. And one of the things that we've seen over the last several years, 2022 to, to the present, the Fed has you know, said, this is what we think, this is what we're gonna do. And then they've done what they said they were gonna do. Yeah. And there are any number of people in the markets, especially in the gold and silver markets, who have said, well, no, you know, I disagree. The Fed's wrong. The Fed doesn't understand what's going on in the economy. The Fed's going to have to lower interest rates further and sooner, and we're going to be going back to 25 basis points. And those people have been consistently wrong. And it's cost them, in, insofar as some of those people, and we, we know some, our investors and our investment fund managers, they have lost money because they refuse to listen to and believe what the Fed has said. So I think the Fed's been pretty clear uh, that there is scope for some reductions in interest rates, but it's not this dynamic, oh, we're going to you know, be cutting interest rates in half or anything like that quickly, mm -hmm. because while, while you have signs of economic weakness, you also have signs of a, a lot of economic strength. And and so the Fed has to be very cautious, and mm -hmm. especially because if you look at it, recessions usually proceed from periods of economic strength. Sometimes they proceed from periods of economic weakness, and we just sort of trickle into a recessionary period. But more often than not, it's that the economy becomes overheated and then drops into a recession. So, you know, you 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 see people now in the market saying, well, maybe we won't have a recession because economic activity is stronger than everybody was thinking. That's actually bad. And that's bad logic because oftentimes it's when economic activity is stronger than everybody's thinking that you see the economy flip over into a recession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I, I, you know, my expectation is the Fed's pretty much going to do what it has indicated it's going to do. So, you know, a quarter of a basis point in September, and then they'll wait and see where we are in November and December. So in that in that thinking, Jeff, for those that are screaming for rate hikes that that or sorry, for rate cuts that want rate cuts, mm -hmm. is this actually something to be a lot more cautious about? You know, is is the Fed actually reacting to recessionary fears, or are they, you know, bringing this in for for a soft landing? I think the Fed is ab absolutely reacting to recessionary fears on their part, not what you hear on the internet or even in the broader market. I think the Fed is because you know we've been saying this for a year. Don't you know people who are hoping for lower interest rates? We were saying you know. Be careful what you wish for, because the Fed will only lower interest rates when they have significant concerns about recessionary economic conditions. And, and so the shift in Fed policy really over the last 12 months or so has indicated that the Fed's economists have become much more concerned about economic growth beyond, say, 2024. 
Jeff, that obviously only affects the US. How does the rest of the world play into this as well? Like, is is there kind of a, a global slowdown that is part to play in um demand for for dollars for more stimulus um yeah. you know how do, how does the rest of the world play into this u.s monetary policy is much more important than the u.s economy uh you know you have 60 percent of foreign exchange reserves held by governments in u.s dollars mm-hmm. and you have 70 to 80 percent of private privately held financial wealth denominated in U.S. dollars. So this the trends in the U.S. dollar exchange rate, trends in the U.S. dollar buying purchasing power, and trends in U.S. interest rates all have a outsized effect on the global economy. Mm-hmm. In addition to that, the U.S. economy is still something greater than 20% of world GDP, and U.S. corporations own enormous portions of the businesses around the world in India, the Netherlands, and other places. A lot of a significant portion of their GDP comes from U.S. owned companies. And the significant portion of demand from, for their goods and services comes either from the U.S. economy, U.S. corporations and consumers, or comes from companies around the world that are in turn dependent on U.S. demand for goods and services. So the U.S. economy has this outsized effect around the world. And and you're you're seeing that, you're seeing much weaker economic activity in Europe, the U.K., and Japan. Part of that has to do with domestic economic and political trends, but part of it has to do with weakness in the U.S., which translates into weakness for imported goods and services. Um, and you're also seeing it in the developing world, too. So the U.S. economy's strength is very important on a global basis, uh, even as the, I mean, when I first started studying this stuff in the 70s, the U.S. was more than 40 percent of world GDP. Now it's, you know, around 20, the low 20s. So we've lost half of our actual level of economic activity as a percentage world uh, economic activity. But we're still very, very critical to the way the world can operate. And it's mm-hmm. it's a big issue. Yeah. So Right now, obviously, we're say, we're facing you know a possible recession. We're facing you know a, a, a another you know adjustment to overnight rates, um, and we're also coming into a very you know hotly contested election. So, what do you think is most important to understand about the election and and how markets, not just metals, will react to? Um, you know, what happens between now and the election and then the outcome as well? Yeah, you know, uh, this year, politics are much more important to overall financial markets than usual. And I think this this election really is sort of an existential uh, election in, in some ways. And I hate using that term that way, but yeah, uh, I think that there's a lot on the line here uh, with the U.S. election, presidential as well as congressional elections, and how it all shakes out will be very important to the U.S. and global economies. And um, the, it's it's very it's very worrisome because you could see. Um, a much worse economic recession, uh, depending on how it all shakes out. Mm -hmm. You you could see a a much worse economic situation, both in the U.S. and globally. And then you could also see a much worse uh, political environment. You know, uh, global, the U.S. global hegemony politically and economically has been deteriorating. And um, it 
will continue to deteriorate the question because the rest of the world's growing now and growing. Uh, the question is how fast will it? And um, yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I have a foreign affairs here from a couple of months ago. And the, the title report was, does America need a new foreign policy? And yeah, <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. Uh, but yes, we definitely need a new uh, foreign policy, which the government has been loath to incorporate mm -hmm. for decades across Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, and it's been very slow. But yeah, you know, there are power, there are pockets of power and influence within the ruling elite, if you will, that realize that we really need to change. Um, but they don't have power to, to affect those changes. Uh, and the improvements that we've seen have been very marginal and easily wiped out by new administrations coming in and reversing them. So what do you think the most important part of that, Jeff? Um, or what what is the most important part of that? Is it the overall spending? Is it, you know, just trying to get along and, and find commonalities with other countries? What do you see as the most important part to that? Well, I think the I you know, the understanding that the world, you know, has been changing for decades and you know, that we need to change not only our foreign policy, but our social and domestic policy. And when I was studying political science in university, you know, there was this rubric that people had, which was that foreign policy should and usually extends from so domestic policy. And the domestic policy has been very bad in the United States and domestic lack of cooperation and that rise of, of acrimony has been very bad and it deteriorated rapidly since the mid 1990s. Um, and that's what really needs to change. And unfortunately, you've got this duopoly between the Republican and Democratic parties uh, that that prohibits substantial improvements in the domestic, political, and social compact. Uh, and it actually exacerbates the differences and the hostilities. And that's the that's the single most important thing to change, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, related to that is social controls. And, you know, we like to think of it in terms of economic terms, but the economic freedoms to start companies, close companies, change companies, move manufacturing plants, all of that is part and parcel and inextricably woven in with social freedoms too. And when you start having the government saying, well, we're going to control everything. You know, you're going back to where we were in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, where, you know, the FAA would say, these are the flights that you can have as an airline, and these are the number of seats, and this is what you're going to charge for them, and this is when you're going to fly. Mm -hmm. And it was airline deregulation, which radically changed air travel from being a much smaller business to being the enormous business that it is now. And you can go through all kinds of businesses that way and in industries that way and see where it is. And there's this, you know, economic freedoms are inextricably bound up with social freedoms. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that or they're willing to give it up. Well, I think I think the energy business is a is a great example of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the over regulation and you know change that has taken place in the in the energy business, whether that be nuclear, um, green, uh, green generation, mm -hmm. whatever that is, you know it it typically leads ends up leading to higher prices and less reliability. Yeah, it, it, it's a problem, and it's funny because you know. Project 2025 talks about disbanding all of the farm support programs. And I've heard ultra conservative people, you know, the, the what was it, the 
before MAGA, there was this other group. I can't remember what they called themselves, the Tea Party. Yeah, and these people would say, well, why do we have subsidies on agricultural prices? And it's like, well, because you need that stability to have the food. Well, when did we start doing this? Well, uh, the pharaohs introduced agricultural policy because, you know, uh, the Nile River <clears throat> flooded <laughs> and wiped out crops or there were droughts and, and agricultural policies and subsidies and government involvement really stems from ancient Egypt. And even before that, because there were agricultural problems before Egypt was the power that wiped out civilizations. And people just don't understand that, you know, and it's very strange. I, mean, I remember in 2008, uh, Obama quoted Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations uh, in, in a debate. He said, you know, uh, it just seems that people who have made a lot of money based on a, an economy that has a lot of government subsidies should pay a fair share of taxes. And, you know, that was like almost a direct quote from Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, 1776. And the next day, the Republicans were saying he was a socialist for saying that. You know, it's like the level of ignorance in public discourse is a major impediment to progress. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that kind of touches on something that you and I were discussing uh, before we hit record here this morning, which is the the quality of data, the quality of information that you're mm -hmm. getting is a real challenge nowadays. It seems like, you know, you can find any any piece of, you know, research or, or data to back up whatever viewpoint you want. So, you know, how do you think about that that challenge? Um, and and how do you face it? Yeah, it's it's always been a problem in across commodities, and it's gotten a lot worse with the rise of the internet and the breakdown of peer reviewing uh, documents and and the fact that you would have you know, I mean, when I started in this business, there was Consolidated Goldfields and Jay Aaron, and they worked together to come up with estimates of gold supply and demand. There was Handy and Harmon and Jay Aaron, and they worked together to put together supply and demand data for silver. Uh, I brought PGM, Platinum Group Metals data to Jay Aaron, and, uh, and you know the, the platinum industry in South Africa was asked the chairman of Jay Aaron to fire me when we published our first platinum report. They didn't want that information out there. Uh, but, you know, there's always been big problems in the quality of data. You can find data to support any position you want. Mm -hmm. The data may be completely false and, and fallacious and just completely made up, but it's out there. And, and if that data and your theory reinforces the worst fears and instincts of people, they'll accept it as Bible. Yeah. And you have, you know, you in our one of our videos recently, you know, somebody said, oh, all the silver gurus say, you know, that the silver price is going to rise. And they listed four people who have been consistently wrong their entire careers, you know, saying that the silver price is going to skyrocket because the world's running out of silver or whatever reason. And yet they're given credibility not because they've been accurate, they've been inaccurate their entire career, and the things they say are spurious, and anybody who knows anything about the silver market supply and demand knows that it's spurious, but they reinforce people's worst instincts, so therefore they're believed. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, all that being said, you know, going into the election, facing these rate cuts, what are your views for... Um, gold and silver prices, let's say, going into the end of 2024 here? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you asked a question earlier about, you know, going up to the re election. And one of the points that we've been making is that the election is just one day in what's going to be a longer process. It's mm -hmm. quite clear. I mean, you know, the Republican Party has prepared court submissions declaring claiming that there are election irregularities in all 50 states. 
And I, you know, I actually heard a Republican politician the other day say, Trump doesn't expect to win and he doesn't even care if he wins because he's going to dispute it regardless. You know, and and if you know anything about Donald Trump, he idolizes Mussolini and Mussolini staged the march on Rome to force the king to appoint him, I guess, president or prime minister, whatever it was, prime minister uh, of Italy. You know, and and so it's not just the election. It's the election and it's going to be the post-election. Mm-hmm. And and we're not quite sure where it goes from there or how it improves or worsens. But our expectation for gold and silver has been for some time that in the final four months of 2024 and the first months of 2025, you would see significantly higher gold and silver prices, partly because of political dysfunctionality and unrest and potential for political violence in the United States. There are a bunch of other factors going on too. The war in Gaza, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, Ukraine now fighting back finally. Uh, Issues in East Asia, China is now pushing on the Philippines, even as it backpedals elsewhere. China is amassing troops on on its uh, border with Myanmar. There is increased uh, incursions between the Chinese, Indian, and Pakistani uh, military forces in the Northwest Frontier Agency, Kashmir. Uh, And and so you've got a lot of other problems there. You've got disunity in the EU. You've got the UK, where the majority of voters say we shouldn't have left the EU. And then across the channel, you have uh, more and more countries where people are saying, hey, the British had it right, we should get out of here. So you've got a whole lot of political dysfunction and everything. And I haven't even spoken about Africa or or Latin America or Southeast Asia. Uh, You know, you have a lot of political dysfunctionality around the world, as well as a maturing economic recovery that presents its own problems and issues. So our expectation is that gold and silver prices are going to rise. Gold, uh, you know, we would not be surprised to see silver prices at record levels. Now, on a record intraday basis, that means $50 or higher. Doesn't mean $500 or $750. It means higher than $50. And on an annual average, it means something on the order of $35, $36 an ounce, uh, which is roughly what it was in 2021, 2022. Mm-hmm. 2011, 2012, I'm sorry. Um with gold, we're look, we've already seen record prices. Prices have risen to levels that we expected to see in the final four months of this year, in the middle four months of this year. Our view, our analysis suggests that prices will go higher because of the economic and political factors that we thought would continue to drive prices higher through the middle of this year into the end of this year and next year. Those things are still in place. So we think we just misjudged how high gold prices would go. Again, it's not $10,000 gold, but you know uh, it is significantly higher than where we are today, mm-hmm. which is about $2,520. So Jeff, if we think longer term about what drives gold prices, is it just you know dollar expansion and gold really reflecting the change in its measuring stick, as it were? No, it's really, there's a gold run, renaissance that we tagged, we, we, we said there was a gold renaissance coming in 2000, and it started to emerge in 2020, uh, 2002, 2003, and it's not necessarily, I mean, if you look at the dollar has done very well over the that 22-year period since 2002. It, it's not the dollar versus gold. It's investors and individuals looking at the world, saying, you know, things are changing. Uh, the international cooperation that the U.S. talks about, and the U.S. hegemony that everybody else talks about, is breaking down. Uh, there are more parts of the world wanting more say in the way the world works. And, you know, the the developing economies 
have been complaining at the UN and the World Bank and the IMF for decades that they're underrepresented in terms of their voting capacity. And Europe and the United States have said, yeah, we're not going to change. Um, and that needs to change on a political basis. It's changing on an economic basis. It's really having headwinds in a financial basis. You know, if you look, people keep talking about how central banks are dumping dollars, but they're not. The U.S. The central bank holdings of U.S. dollars are larger now than ever before, and they've been very stable around 58 to 62 percent of foreign exchange holdings by central banks for decades. But you've seen the holdings of the euro go from 29 percent 20 years ago to about 19 percent now. And you've seen the holdings of other currencies, not the euro or the dollar or the yen or the pound sterling, but other currencies. That has gone from 2% or so to about 10%. So you are seeing some diversification in the monetary system, but it's been very slow. And there are a lot of headwinds in the financial and economic environment that have caused pause and the political environment, because quite frankly, one of the strengths in the U.S. dollar is the fact that the U.S. has enormous economic benefits compared to other uh, countries, and it has, believe it or not, protected borders. Yeah, we do have the southern border problem, uh, but other countries that produce currencies that could stand as alternatives to the U.S. dollar have longer histories than the U.S. And those histories are populated with currency crises and currency collapses and government collapses. You know, so the alternative to the dollar is relatively limited, as Maurice Chevalier said. You know, um, and I think that investors and individuals around the world over the last twenty, yeah, last quarter century have said. Things are bad and they're going to get worse politically, economically. You know, you had the war on terror, you had the trade center bombing, you had the U.S. invasion of Iraq, you had oil prices go from ten dollars to one hundred and thirty dollars, back to twenty dollars, and now it's about seventy dollars. You know, you you've had so much economic, political, and financial problems over the last twenty years, and every time that reinforces the view among investors that they should own more gold and silver. Yeah. From the P, from the time when the Bretton Woods dollar gold standard ended, 1971, until 2000, you would see economic and political problems occur for a year or two, and people would buy a lot of gold. Then the world would get better, and they would buy less gold. And after 2000, 2002, you saw the you saw an upward shift in the investment demand curve for gold. More investors have bought more gold at higher prices for a longer period of time than ever before in history. And in fact, investors have bought more gold since 2002 than they had bought in the five or six millennia, depending on you know, where you grew up, um, prior to 1966. Yeah. Investors have been buying a lot of gold because they look at the world and they say, I should have some of my wealth denominated in gold. And there's been a renaissance in that understanding. And that understanding has also spilled over to central banks at developing countries and to a lesser extent in industrialized countries. So you're, you've seen this renaissance in what we call gold stock demand, investment, private sector investment, financial demand and monetary demand. Yeah, we wrote it, you know, I was involved in a lot of the gold sales and gold leasing operations of the 1980s. And after we left Goldman Sachs in 86, uh, that business accelerated for us uh, explicitly because we were no longer part of Goldman Sachs. Uh, but I wrote a piece in, in the late 80s called The Normative Role of Gold in Monetary Reserves. Gold as a portion, as a denominator of a currency, pretty much passe from a monetary perspective. It's not going to happen. But gold as a monetary reserve remained an important factor. 
And so you look at like Switzerland or England and other central banks that said, okay, I have 90% of my, my reserves in gold because of the old dollar gold standard at 20 million ounces in the case of England. I want to get rid of half of it. I don't want to get rid of all of it. I want to come down to 10 million ounces where it represents 50% of my monetary reserves. And the other 50% are those currencies I need to finance international trade and capital flows. Mm -hmm. Switzerland did the same thing. You know, we had 96, I think it was, uh, 86 million ounces. We want to sell 43 million ounces. Other central banks didn't make it public, but they were doing the same thing. But they kept half of their gold. Yeah. So we were talking about, yeah, gold has a mon has a normative role in monetary reserves. And we sold, it was a research report and affiliated consulting and advisory work. We sold that to most central banks in the late 80s, early 90s. And uh, it's funny because, you know, we were talking now, you know, we need to find the time to do the next big report on the monetary role of gold. And it's still going to be as a reserve. And that's in the monetary system. But the exact same thinking applies in the private sector financial uh, realm. So, Jeff, I just kind of want to square that circle if we can. You know, mm -hmm. you're you're saying that that demand and holdings for U.S. dollars hasn't really changed that much. And yet central banks have been buying record amounts of gold, let's say over the past two years, it's recently dropped off a little bit. So mm -hmm. what is the the actual role that, for example, China or or some of these other countries that have been buying record yeah. amounts of gold for them, um, right. what role do they see for it? And and is that demand continuing? Well, I I I, I came close to talking, verbalizing it before. There is an impulse on the part of monetary authorities as well as private financial entities, people, mm -hmm. uh, to diversify the basis, the denominator of their wealth. Now, in the developed world, as I said, a lot of central banks that were major trading parties, Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada, the United, you know, United States is a special one because it issues the U.S. dollar. So it can't hold U.S. dollars as foreign exchange. Uh, but um, those countries had collected gold during the Bretton Woods period, and they had 80, 90, 97% of their reserves in gold. Mm -hmm. They have been diversifying away from that since the late 70s uh, to reduce their exposure to gold and to have bigger stockpiles of currencies uh, to finance capital and, and trade flows. On the other side, you have the countries that have been emerging since 1971, China, Russia, India, South Africa, other countries that are emerging in developing economies that did not collect a lot of gold because they weren't major trading counterparts during the Bretton Woods era. But they became major trading exporters after that, you know, with the, the Asian tigers in the 80s and 90s and China in the 80s and 90s and oughties. And they have 80, 90, 95 percent of their reserves in dollars. So they want to diversify their portfolio by adding other currencies and gold. You know, Russia is a special case, and you have to set it aside. There's been this hostility between Russia and China, or Russia and the United States, and Russia, uh, Russia and the rest of the world uh, since Putin took over, or even before that. Um, the Russian-U.S. hostilities actually predate the creation of the United States. It was when we were colonies that Russia and the United States, United colonies became enemies. And it had to do with economics and such. But other countries want to diversify their portfolio, their, their monetary reserves. And so gold's still going to be, you know, they're buying gold. You look at it, and with the exceptions of like pariah states, Russia, uh, Venezuela, you, you see that most countries would like to have, you know, 5%, 10%, 15% of their monetary reserves in gold. 
That seems to be what they're shooting for. You know, and that's good because that's an enormous amount of gold. It's very small in terms of dollars and currencies and monetary reserves, but it is enough to help support the gold price and drive the gold price higher. And that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. We're talking about decades. You know, as I said, there's an upward shift, not only in the investment demand curve, but in the stock demand curve, which includes central banks. And investors and central banks will be buying more gold at higher prices on an ongoing basis for many years to come. And it'll fluctuate with economic and political conditions. But overall, everybody sort of learned that they should own some gold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, Jeff, we often hear about the rise of the BRICS countries and, and alliance becoming stronger. And, and does, mm -hmm. I, I want to get your sense of this, of if it actually ends up meaning a a a substantial impact, let's say, in demand for, for dollars? Or is it kind of a pipe dream for the BRICS countries to actually work together considering some of their history of, of conflict? Yeah, you know, um, in the 1950s, Nehru in India and Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt and several other leaders of developing countries I think Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana was in there, started what they called the non-aligned movement. We, we're, not, we're not in with communist China and, and Soviet Union, but we're also not necessarily in with the United States and Europe. And they created the non-alignment movement. They created a non-alignment organization that was supposed to sort of give them a forum away from those other two blocks. And BRICS is a lot like that. And what happened was the non-alignment movement sort of was subsumed into the United Nations, and it's still there. And it has like 140 members. Uh, and it, as I said, you know, it's lobbied since the 70s at least. Hey, we should have a greater percentage of the voting power in the United Nations, in the World Bank, in the IMF. And the U.S. and Europe have simply said, no, we're not going to give it to you. Or as Nancy Pelosi said to AOC when AOC took power, uh, was first elected, no one gives you power. You have to take it. Yeah. Uh, one of the more astute things that Nancy Pelosi ever said. Um, uh, so I think BRICS is like that. And part of the problem is that the BRICS was created, I mean, the term was created coined by a Goldman Sachs salesperson. Yeah, they were trying to sell government bonds from Brazil and Russia and India and China. And then later they added South Africa. Uh, and they were trying to sell these and people were saying, are you crazy? These countries are small, they're unstable, they're you know developing. And, and Goldman Sachs said, no, 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 they're, they're, their sovereign debt is good. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly worked out. And that's where BRICS came from. And initially, it was a matter of pride to have been considered by Goldman Sachs to be part of the BRICS. And now the BRICS wants to expand. And there are all these other countries saying, you know, let's get in there. And if you listen to what the BRICS boys were saying last year when they were debating this and again this year, it was like there were members of the BRICS that were saying, this is an exclusive club, and we're proud to be part of this exclusive club. If we start inviting all these other smaller economies in, we're sort of diluting the prestige of being a member of the BRICS. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Russia, because it's really up against the wall financially, uh, was saying, no, we really need as many people in here as possible. And, and, um, so it's hard to say what BRICS is going to be. Uh, you know, they won't have their own currency. Uh, there are people who would like to divide the world up into trading blocks. Um, I think that's a terrible idea. It would be very bad on a global basis. It would be very bad for individual countries. 
But there were people who would say, well, let's have like the US, Europe, Japan axis, and let's have the China, Russia, India axis, and, and we'll figure out where Southeast Asia goes, uh, belongs. So I don't think that BRICS necessarily, it's, it's a, it would be a bad thing if that happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know that BRICS goes that way. I think BRICS continues to be a forum for emerging nations and second world nations is what we used to call them to, to voice what they think should be going on in the world. Um, if the United States and Europe were smart, they would diversify power in the existing institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. So, Jeff, I want to kind of go back to what I asked you about gold, about how what drives long term prices for gold. But instead, let's do silver. You know, there's a obviously a big industrial demand for silver. So, you know, if we if we do see, you know, let's say fifty dollars in the relatively short term, what are the the major drivers going forward for silver, if not only industrial? It's also investment demand. If you look at every, well, if you look at the two times that silver prices have spiked sharply higher, from five dollars to fifty dollars between nineteen seventy eight and nineteen eighty, mm -hmm. and then from five dollars to fifty dollars between two thousand four, two thousand three, and two thousand eleven, in each of those instances, it was investment demand that drove the price sharply higher. When the price got over $30, $35, there was a sharp reduction in fabrication demand, which shifted the surplus available for investors mm -hmm. and ultimately led to the decline in prices. So the first thing you have to understand is that historically, higher silver prices are wholly dependent on investment demand. Going forward, fabrication demand definitely is important there because it flavors the supply demand balance available for investors. If you thought of investors as passive, oh, there's a surplus, I'll absorb it. Uh, that's not how it works. Investors cause surpluses by bidding the price up away from fabricators. Uh, fabrication demand is rising in, in solar and in a variety of electronic applications. Uh, it's not nearly as dynamic as some of the promoters say, but it is there. It is tightening the market in which investors then come in and say, hey, I want to buy. Mm -hmm. Right now, we've got a situation over the last year or a half or so where you've had relatively low net investment to make despite what the promoters and promotional organizations say, you've actually had very low investment demand last year and this year on a net basis. People were buying a lot of silver, but other people were selling silver. People who had bought silver in 2021 with the Wall Street silver, let's, you know, um, let's take all the silver out of London and New York, which is absolutely nonsensical. But a lot of people bought silver at 28, 30, 32, 33, $34 an ounce. And people say, well, silver didn't get to $34 an ounce. No, bullion didn't, but silver coins and bars did. And a lot of people bought silver coins and bars with a high premium uh, to silver bullion. And there's been a lot of dissatisfied investors selling in 2023 and 2024. When that dissipates, and then you start seeing net investment demand rise in line to reflect the gross investment demand, then you'll start seeing the silver price rise. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other side of that, there's obviously big industrial demand for platinum and palladium. What is you know the the longer term outlook for those metals as well considering you know this this move away from internal combustion engines um and and i'd like to also understand if um you know in a in a moment of of fear or panic those metals actually end up taking on a, a somewhat investor or monetary role as well um yeah we don't have 
particularly great or bullish expectations for platinum and palladium prices, primarily because they are losing market share, you know, 60% or more of fabrication demand for palladium and 50% or so for platinum is auto. And it is losing market and market share to electric vehicles. Um, that said, supply is re very limited. I mean, if you think about gold and silver, you're talking about hundreds of mines and in dozens of countries. When you start talking about platinum and palladium, you're really, you know, there are mines in Zimbabwe, in the United States and Canada, but you're really talking about the United, South Africa and Russia. Mm -hmm. And so you have relatively limited supplies at relatively high cost producers. And so for platinum and palladium, the supply of the metal is much more important than it is for gold and silver. And, and the, po the positive thing that you can say about potential for price increases in platinum and palladium is, well, you may see some significant declines in, in mine supply, you know, uh, as opposed to gold and silver, where you say, I'm looking for investors to continue to buy. And in the case of silver, you're also seeing stronger new uses, uh, solar power and some other applications. So we don't have that great of an expectation for platinum and plating prices. We do think that the scope for prices to spike up periodically due to supply constraints is there, but we don't necessarily see the prices going back to levels that they were at mm -hmm. previous decades. And and is there, you know, in a moment of fear, a, a monetary or or investor element that comes into that? There are, yeah. Typically, when you see a moment of fear, people first run to gold and the dollar, and then to silver, and then after that's passed over, you have this sort of period, like you know, if it's like a glider plane where you're you're not descending yet, you're, you're, you're plateauing. And there will be, uh, there will sometimes be periods of time where people say, well, okay, so gold and silver look like they peak. What about platinum and palladium? And you'll see some investment money going into platinum and palladium, but it tends to be a relatively short-lived uh, phenomenon um, there. And it's very limited. And, you know, these are, these are industrial metals. They, they're not financial metals. They've never well, platinum, I guess, had a brief role in Tsarist Russia uh, as a monetary metal, but they're not, they haven't been monetary metals. They're primarily industrial commodities. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Jeff. Well, I really appreciate you walking us through your views on all of these all of these markets and inter intricacies. Um, is there anything you'd le like to leave our audience to to think about or consider? Well, they can definitely come to CPM Group's website, cpmgroup.com or go to our YouTube channel. And at the YouTube channel, they'll see these twice weekly videos that we do. Mm -hmm. At, a, at our, our website, they can see a lot of free reads and videos and free reports, a library, and there's a section on the evidence for and against silver conspiracies. There's been several studies that have been done uh, by the CFTC and others. We have another section on the importance of good data and, and the fundamental flaws that exist in a lot of the market data that's out there, then you can buy our gold, silver, platinum yearbooks. They're available. And you can send a note to us at info at CPM Group asking about how we can help you manage your commodity and precious metals price exposure. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time today, Jeff. I really appreciate you, uh, again, walking us through these, these ideas. And uh, we'll, we'll speak to you next time. Thank you, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.